Hey everyone, welcome back to Wicked Deeds. We're your hosts, I'm Brittany. And I'm John. And today, we're going to be discussing an older case that hasn't received much, or practically any, coverage in the true crime world. It's one that lacks details, but is riddled with strange coincidences, and has an interesting link to a more modern era that may help in bringing together people holding valuable information. Today's case is about the murder of John William Leonard Sr. There isn't too much out there about John William Leonard Sr., especially regarding his early life, as his case hasn't been publicized very much. As always, I'll give you as comprehensive of a rundown as I can regarding everything I was able to find. So, John William Leonard Sr. grew up in the Elmhurst, Pennsylvania area, which is in the northeastern area of the state. In 1942, when John was just 24 years old, he enlisted in the U.S. Army Air Corps. And if you caught the year, 1942... Well, that was right smack dab in the middle of World War II. It's unclear exactly where he was stationed, but I do know that he spent his time in the Air Corps somewhere in Europe. However, sometime after he began his service, he was captured and spent 22 months as a prisoner of war. Thankfully, though, when the war ended in 1945, John was released from his captivity. Do you know where he was held as a POW? No, unfortunately, like, literally everything about this case is so hard to find and it's like very very basic information if you find anything about him being a prisoner of war it's just that that's all you hear Mm -hmm. okay when he returned home to pennsylvania after the war at some point he would meet his future wife madeline who was a woman from maine in 1952 john landed a job as a taxi driver for a company called mix taxi service this seemed to be his main gig but it was reported that he often worked odd jobs on the side John and Madeline would go on to have five children, three boys, John, Timothy, and Caven. I'm unsure exactly how to pronounce his name, as there seems to be a few different pronunciations, so I apologize if I've gotten it wrong. Anyway, the Leonards also had twin daughters, Dolores, who goes by Lori, and Debbie. John and Madeline raised the family in their apartment located above Mixed Taxi Service, which was reported to have been located on Route 390 in Cresco, Pennsylvania. The Leonards had a wonderful relationship with the Mick family, who were the owners of the taxi business. John was a very active member of his community, and he's been described as private, hardworking, and overall a family man. John's daughters described their father as strict but loving in an article with the Pocono Record. They didn't have it super easy, though. They certainly weren't a family with great wealth, with John working side jobs here and there to provide for his wife and children. In an article with BRC TV 13, Lori mentioned something that stood out to me as ironic. She stated, quote, Sometimes he took us for rides in a limousine the mix had as a part of their business. Other kids would see us riding in that limo and ask if we were rich, end quote. Regardless of what the neighborhood kids thought, money wasn't always everything. The Leonards remember having a happy life regardless of material possessions. However, at some point, it seems as though that happiness would fade, at least between John and Madeline. And just a few years after the couple had their youngest child, they split up. It's reported in the Pocono record that Madeline was the one to leave the home, and John took full custody of all five children. I can only imagine how difficult that must have been for him at the time, being the sole provider for five children, working as a taxi driver, and also attempting to take other jobs here and there to support his family. So... On September 8, 1970, John Leonard was working his shift at Mick's taxi service. From what I can tell, it seemed as though when he wasn't taking fares, he'd spend his free time in his apartment above the business while waiting for any calls for service to come in. On this particular day, he was with his kids and they were discussing their plans for the next day. You see, the following day would be the first day of school for the five youngsters. That afternoon, while he's chatting with his kids, a call came in with a request for a ride. It's reported that the call came in at 2.40 that afternoon. The request for a ride was coming from a location known as Buck Hill Falls Inn, a resort in the Poconos Mountains, 
with the drop-off destination being in Mountain Home, Pennsylvania. The distance from the inn to where the individual needed to be dropped off was approximately a five-mile trip, or a 10 to 15-minute fare for John. Now, Buckhill Falls Inn was only about a three to five minute drive from John's home in Cresco, so he hopped in his 1966 black Plymouth sedan with the mounted taxi sign atop of it and made the quick drive to Barrett Township, Monroe County, Pennsylvania, where the lodge was located. Which I find to be such an odd thing to call it Barrett Township, Monroe County, but that's like literally how it's labeled everywhere. Why wouldn't you just call it Barrett, or even just Barrett Township. It's so odd to follow it up with the Monroe County bit. And that was part of the Poconos? It was. Oh, gotta love the Poconos. Gotta love the Poconos. <laughs> John and I have a story from the Poconos. Yeah, but uh, it's probably one of those things where they had a bunch of little villages, and in order to differentiate what they were, they used those extended titles to kind of make it easier to figure out. Probably. I just think, if any of our listeners know, I would love to like hear from someone that lives in Monroe County or whatever, like, do you always end your town name with the county that it's in, too? Like, I just find it to be so strange. Right. But back to our story. At 2.44 p.m., so just four minutes after that request for the fare came in, John was heard over the radio. But from what I can find, it's unclear what he said over the speaker. If I had to guess, just knowing how close by his destination was, he was likely alerting Mix that he'd arrived at Buck Hill Falls Inn. After this 2.44 p.m. call over the radio, there was no further word from John. Time would tick by, and after almost an hour of not hearing from John and no updates on the passenger he was supposed to be picking up, his boss, Donald Mick, became concerned. He hopped in his car and made the quick drive over to Buck Hill Falls just to check on John and see what was up. Upon his arrival at 3.45 p.m., he saw John's car still sitting in the driveway up to the lodge. As Donald approached the vehicle, he noticed something was very wrong. John had been shot four times in the head. Donald immediately phoned police to come to the scene. Bob Labar, who was actually one of just two full-time police officers in the small town back in 1970, was right around the corner from Buck Hill Falls, so he was able to make it to the scene in near record time. Bob told the Pocono Record about his experience when he first arrived on scene. He stated, quote, I saw the cab and the body inside. I notified my chief, started taping off the area, and made sure no civilians got close to the scene. I got into a bit of a confrontation with two people who got too close and told them to leave, end quote. My first instinct is that this must have been some type of, I don't want to say hit, but something planned where whoever killed him put in this call specifically to have him go there and then they killed him because... It's not like uh, thinking they it, it lured like, him there. Yes, that's what I'm saying. I think that whoever put this call in lured him there to kill him because they shot him four times in the head. It's not like it was a carjacking. They didn't take his car. Mm-hmm. Um, so it seems like that would be my first instinct. A little more premeditated. Then. Yeah, because what would the odds be that he gets a call to this place, he gets a fare to go there and gets randomly shot in the head four times? Mm hmm just while driving up to Buck Hill Falls. Mm-hmm. It um, smells of premeditation or somebody, mm-hmm. somebody having planned this. Okay. After a few hours, Pennsylvania State Police arrived on scene and pretty much took over the investigation from the second they got there. Barrett Township was a tiny town with an even smaller police department with only the chief and two dedicated officers. So I guess I can see why state police would want to have a handle on a murder investigation rather than leaving it with a small PD regardless of how on the ball Officer Labar had been. Right, they're still limited in the amount of resources they have and the amount of times that they've dealt with some type of investigation like this. Exactly. At some point, authorities would go on to interview patrons of the hotel to see if anyone frequenting the establishment or working there had seen anything. And thankfully, detectives were in luck. It's unclear exactly when this information came in or who took the following statement, but regardless of that fact... It's been reported that a man, who weirdly enough was also a part-time police officer, worked at Buckhill Falls and he was on shift that afternoon and had seen something of note. He stated that around 2.50 p.m., which, remember, is roughly five to six minutes after John had made that last call over the radio, he'd seen John, quote, going up the drive toward the main building on the hotel property, end quote. From there, he stated that he saw an individual approach John's vehicle and seemingly chat with him. This witness was able to provide a description of the man he'd seen, but from what I can tell, 
a sketch was never produced, and if it was, it hasn't been released publicly. The witness stated that the person he saw was a white male with dark hair, and he believed he was anywhere from 30 to 40 years old. He also described what this unknown man was wearing, which has been described as dark-framed or horn-rimmed glasses, dark pants, and a blue and green windbreaker-style jacket. He also made note that the man was carrying a globe store bag. At some point, and this is just me guessing, I'd have to think the witness must have turned away and didn't hear or see anything else, as this description that I just mentioned was the only thing reported. This employee of the inn was also, from what I can tell, the only witness to ever come forward with information regarding the incident that had either seen John or really seen anything during that time period. So he never saw any type of confrontation. He only saw this guy approach the car and then talk to John. That's it. And do you have like a, either an overhead view or any idea of what this, I guess, property looked like? Yes. Would you like to see it? Yeah, I'd like to see it because okay, when, when the witness described that he was driving up the main driveway to uh, what the, whatever the main building, mm-hmm. I'm just interested to see like what else he had to drive through in order to get there, what else was around. So there aren't really any like aerial photos, at least on this site that I'm looking at, but this is kind of like what I think would be like the main drive. You know what I get out of that picture? Tell me. Midsummer Murders. Oh my God, yes. It looks like the first episode, like that big mansion that they go to. Yeah. It does. It totally does. Okay, this is not at all what I imagined. I imagined more like, uh, you probably don't remember it. We drove past it when we went to North Conway, Mm -hmm. uh, the Red Jacket Inn. No, it's like I don't it's it. like this big grandiose inn style resort or whatever and it's up like kind of on a hill mm-hmm. and there's like this long driveway that goes up to it so i was kind of thinking you know this main building was going to be up visible from the roadway but they had this long windy driveway and maybe mm-hmm. there were other properties around there but from this picture i mean it looks pretty secluded almost it seems like kind of this big like i would say like it's grandiose it kind of looks like a castle yeah it's uh <laughs> i don't know if this is because of the date of the pictures or whatever but it looks very like haunted, like bad things happen at this place. Mm-hmm. Um, almost like it'd, it'd be like a conjuring house type deal. Okay. All right. I see what you're That's saying. That's kind of the vibe that I get from that, but. Okay. So we're going to go back to our story now. I feel like we were a little off track there, but what I was getting at previously is thinking about the fact that he was shot and he was shot four times. Unless this killer used a silencer, wouldn't you think someone might've heard something? Yeah, maybe not a silencer specifically or something too dead in the noise or, yeah, yeah. or whatever. But it is um, it is odd that this part-time officer or this employee or whatever was able to see this guy approach. He was close enough to get a good description of him mm-hmm. to be able to describe the glasses. Yep. Like if you can say yep. horn rim glasses, you got to be fairly close enough. Yeah. So he's close enough to give that description and to see all this transpire, but not close enough to hear what was going on. I'm wondering if maybe, you know... That globe store bag, the killer was concealing the firearm in there, and maybe, oh, maybe. it had maybe yeah. it had some type of pillow in the bag or something that mm-hmm. would muffle the the sound of it if he shot through it. Okay. Type thing. Okay, uh, that makes sense. I do find it odd though that he was close enough to give a description, but not hear you know four shots ring out. Yeah, exactly. And I just think knowing the time frame too. So like he arrives there at two forty four. You would assume he arrives there at two forty four because that's when the last call over the radio went through maybe he was like pulling up through the driveway and got there like a couple minutes later so within less than five minutes really you've got this guy walking up to him and talking to him but then he's not found for another hour because if the call came in at 244 and then donald showed up at the property at 345 that's pretty much an exact hour so you would assume that it would have happened between 250 and 330 maybe yeah probably i I would assume that it probably happened Shortly after this part-time officer turned away and went on with his everyday business. But then how did nobody else notice that there is a guy that has been shot in the driveway of this hotel? Looking at those pictures, it seems relatively not barren, but it it doesn't seem like it's a bustling area where a lot of people are going in and out. Well, it was. I mean, people really liked this place. And it was like a 400-room hotel and lodge. Like, it was huge it was frequented a lot i mean don't get me wrong like and the main driveway i assume has to be if it's called the main driveway that's where everybody pretty much went onto the property from that's what it seems like i don't know and that's odd to 
to think that nobody saw anything, nobody called anything in, or maybe it was one of those things where it's like, this is none of my business. I'm not going to go look because it's maybe they weren't close enough to the car or maybe it was like literally smack dab in the middle of the driveway. And like, it seems like it's relatively wide. Mm -hmm. So if someone's driving on the other side of the road, maybe they didn't even notice. Yeah. Like who's going to be walking down that driveway, you know? Or if he was shot four times in the head, he might've been slumped over into the passenger seat at that point. True. Yeah. So people driving by may not have even seen him through the window because of whatever his position was. Yeah. Or they could have just thought this guy's sleeping. Yeah. For all you know. Yeah. But the fact that this happened, nobody saw anything, nobody heard anything, and then the guy was able to sit there for an mm-hmm. hour. Mm-hmm. That is strange. I think you're right about narrowing down the time between 2.50 and 3.45. Yeah. I mean, you would assume, obviously... It had to happen during that time. Yeah. But if John's vehicle and his dead body was found in the same spot where that part-time officer saw him speaking to that, that you know, unknown person, that gentleman, yeah. at 2.50. Mm-hmm. It probably happened right around that time because if he's having a conversation with that guy, he's not going to have a conversation with him in that spot for a half an hour. He's, yeah. go, he's going there to pick up a fare. Yep. Whether or not this was the person that called in the fare to try and set him up or kill him or whatever, mm-hmm. that's to be determined. Yep. But. If he was in that same spot, it likely happened very shortly after that employee witnessed him talking to that guy. Yeah, yeah. the conversation happening. And another thing I wanted to touch on, too, that I had a question about while I was researching is this whole Globe Store bag thing. The thing that stood out to me is when I was looking up Globe Store, I'm like, OK, well, this this is very specific what this employee is saying this guy was holding. So I looked up Globe Store. And it was a department store that was located in Scranton, Pennsylvania, which is nearly a 45-minute drive from Buck Hill Falls. So if I was investigating this case, I would question that. And I would say, does this bag have any importance? Could it have significance in finding who killed John? Did he frequent the store recently and he's given this bag to carry merchandise in? Well, I'm wondering, you said department store, but... You know, what do they sell at this department store? That's a good question, and I did not even think of that. Because now I think if you were to tell, you know, Gen Zs, oh, I'm going to the department store. Mm. For me, I think like maybe like a Kmart type thing. Okay, I was going with Macy's. Yeah, well, a Kmart or a Macy's or mm-hmm. Caldors, if you remember that. What the fuck is a <laughs> Right, exactly. <laughs> it, was, it was like a Kmart's competitor around oh, here. Oh, okay. Um, but that's kind of what I think of, but... Maybe it was more like, you know, a Walmart was back then where Mm. they sold everything and could he have bought a firearm there? True. Let me look. Okay. It doesn't exist anymore. So it says for the store directory, first floor is cosmetics, fragrances, sportwear, blah, blah, blah. Second floor, coats, better sportswear, dresses, shirts, lingerie. Third floor, houseware, china, hair salon, spa. Fourth floor, children's clothing, furniture. Fifth floor executive offices. So this, to me, feels like a Macy's. So he probably couldn't have bought a firearm in there. But I think the most important thing is just knowing, like, okay, if this person had frequented Globe Store that day or that weekend, you know, maybe they were just taking a visit to the Poconos Mountains and they went shopping and maybe they could check the records of, you know, whoever had bought stuff from the store that day or that weekend. Yeah, or at a minimum, you now have a decent description to go back to that store and say did you see a guy that looked did you see like a guy this? that looked like this yeah, yeah yeah exactly so before we continue on i do just want to make it clear that we don't actually know who this guy the witness saw was whether he's the individual that called in the fair or not honestly he could be someone that was staying at the lodge and they saw john and stopped to chat and for all we know the two could have just known each other and they were talking so i just want to make it clear that it's not ever been stated That this guy was the one that called in the fair. We are just assuming. Right. And just based on what we know so far, or based on what I know so far, it's the only connection that we have. He's the last person that was seen talking to John, and it was right around the time or during the time frame when he was killed. Exactly. But anyway, as the evening of September 8th, 1970 wrapped up, state police would impound John's car after dusting for fingerprints and taking what's been described as tests. As the investigation continued, it was determined that John had been shot with a small caliber weapon and there was no known motive for his murder. Authorities seemed to have already ruled out the idea that it could have been a robbery as nothing had been taken from the car or from John himself. That would be going along the same lines of what I was thinking. Mm -hmm. Probably called there, 
killed there. Only reason he was called there was... For this purpose. For this purpose. Because nobody took the car, nobody took any of his property. He was just left there, so... Do you think the small caliber weapon has anything to do with maybe the sound not being heard or not like reverberating off something or... I mean, maybe. I think if someone were to hear a forty-five caliber being fired or a 9 millimeter being fired, mm -hmm. they probably would have heard a twenty two being fired. And a twenty two, just for clarification for our listeners who are it's, like me, that's the small caliber, right? Yeah, it's, it's a very small caliber, generally used in handguns, sometimes in small rifles. Okay. Only other thing, if you're trying to gauge what I'm thinking or if you want my input as far as does the small caliber narrow anything down... Mm -hmm. You got to think with a smaller caliber, you probably have a smaller, more easily concealable firearm. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you think women would carry a smaller firearm, mm -hmm. a smaller caliber firearm, easier to fire, easier to conceal. You think of like, um, if you look at like Western movies or mm -hmm. like cabaret yeah. era, yeah, right? Yeah. You have these women that would carry like a little Derringer pistol, like a one shot pistol in mm -hmm. their little uh, leg band or whatever that's called. Well, is it kind of like the girl from or the lady from uh, Death on the Nile that had it in her hat? Yes, exactly. Okay, all right. right. Yeah, so it, very easy to easy to conceal. Mm -hmm. um, hey, maybe the Globe Store bag was like a tiny little paper bag. You don't know. Maybe they held it in there. Right. So anyway, detectives were working to try and figure out who could have killed John Leonard Sr. And more importantly, why? And while they're trying to figure this out, the residents of Barrett Township were absolutely terrified. This is just another one of those small towns where everyone knew everyone, and crime like this was unheard of. Bob Labar, the responding officer in John's case, told the Pocono Record, quote, That was the first time I can remember when people in this community started locking their doors and carrying guns for protection, end quote. Now, remember how I mentioned earlier that John's wife, Madeline, had moved away and John maintained full custody of their children? Well, it was reported that she did come back to take the kids now that their father had been killed. As time went on and Madeline became the children's sole caregiver, it seems as though there really wasn't much of an investigation going on regarding John's case. It's unclear if any of these tests that state police had run on the car came up with anything, or if they'd been able to find any fingerprints of note from the dusting that was completed. If there was any sort of in-depth investigation going on, it certainly wasn't publicized. Authorities were also unable to locate the individual who supposedly spoke with John outside his taxi cab that afternoon. But something that I was curious about regarding the fingerprints, just thinking about the crime scene being a taxi, it would probably be difficult to pinpoint anything as there are likely multiple people in and out of the car on a regular basis. What I do think could be more important would be to know where these gunshots came from. Were they shot from outside the car into John's open driver's side window or did they come from the back seat of the car where a passenger may have been sitting? I think that could eliminate the guy that was outside the car if authorities knew that fact, which, I mean, I assume they do, but we don't know that. So it's something that I was actively thinking about while I was looking into this. Yeah, I totally agree with that. When you first started telling this story, I immediately came to the opinion that he was shot from outside his driver's side window. Okay. I don't think you can necessarily rule out this person that he was seen speaking to. Mm -hmm. After that part-time employee turned away, he could have gotten into the backseat of the car. Well, yeah, that's exactly what I was thinking, too. Or it could have been somebody else who was, like, walking out behind and, say, John just knew this guy with the Globe store bag. And right. they were like, oh, hey, Joe Schmo. Like, that's apparently the name I'm going <laughs> to use for everybody in these episodes. <laughs> but he's like, oh, hey, you know, like, they chat for a minute or two, and then the fair actually comes out. Like, you mm -hmm. can't rule out that option either to say maybe it was somebody else that did get into the back of the car. Yeah, that too. Or I guess you can't rule out that the shots could have came from the passenger side window either. Mm -hmm. If all of his windows were rolled down in the vehicle because maybe it was a warm day or whatever. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was September, early September. So, yeah. so. Probably still warm in Pennsylvania. It is here in Rhode Island. Mm -hmm. So, So yeah, that would be a valuable piece of information to either say, I think if the shots came from the passenger side. Mm-hmm. And this suspect or person of interest was seen talking from the driver's side. Mm -hmm. I think maybe that would be more likely to rule that person out. Rather than them being in the back because they could have just gotten Right. The they back. could have gotten yeah. into the back seat because maybe that was the person that called in the fair. Or they could have shot him from outside the driver's side window during that conversation. But it would be less likely that they would walk around the vehicle mm -hmm. and shoot from the other side if that happened to have been the case. Yeah. And as far as the fingerprints go, I think you're dead on on that mm -hmm. where... You know, you have so many people in and out of the car. 
it's going to be hard to narrow down what's of note and what's just someone that had a fare from one place to another. Right. It's uh, it's not the era of mass fingerprint testing either. It's not like they, yeah. they're going to take uh, they're going to be able to pull you know a hundred fingerprints and run them through an APHIS machine or something and get mm-hmm. hits back within five ten minutes if this person's prints had ever been ran before. Yeah. So they're kind of behind the eight ball on that one. I agree. And then the other thing too that I think is really interesting is regarding the fare and the person that called in the fare. When looking on some websites about John's case, it's been stated that the individual that called in the fare for the cab ride was a, quote, white male. So based on this witness's statement, we know the guy he was chatting with was a white male. But how is it that you can determine the caller for the fare was a white male? My thought is maybe it's like an accidental clue that's been reported that alludes to the fact that this guy that was outside the car is the guy because he was a white male. Like, how can you say, like, this dude called and he was white? You don't know that. I mean, thinking of reasons why or how they would know that from taking the call is, all right, we're going to send our taxi guy over there. Uh, what do you look like? Oh, I, I guess, yeah. So you could find him. Oh, I'm you know, I'm a, I'm a white guy wearing a maroon long sleeve shirt right now. All right, I can see that. I didn't really think of that. Like, that could I mean, be it one was reason. back in 1970, so it's not like, you know... It's not like an Uber where you come up and you have the person's exact location. Yeah. I'm also going to guess that in the Poconos in the 70s, mm-hmm. it was probably predominantly white. Most likely. And maybe based on accents in the time or mm-hmm. whatever, maybe the taxi company deduced that themselves. I mean, they get a lot of calls from random people. Yeah. Maybe it was just something that was put out that wasn't even totally known Yeah, as fact. So, I, I mean, I had mentioned before, too, it's like we don't know that this guy was the caller. We don't know any of that. But this was just one of those things that as I was researching, I noticed that specific wording. Mm-hmm. I was like, is this them saying this is the guy? Yeah. So before we move on in the story, mm-hmm. we've kind of talked about where the shots were fired from. Mm-hmm. We talked about the fingerprints. Now we've talked about this guy being maybe not positively identified through the phone call as a white male. Mm -hmm. But something else you touched on just before this was custody of the children. Yes. Did John gain full custody of the children through a court order? I mean, it's not very often that when a husband and wife split up Mm -hmm. that the father gets the children. Yeah. Without a big stink being put up. Mm -hmm. So what were the circumstances behind why John took full custody of everybody? I love when you ask me these questions, (laughs) but I hate that I can't give you answers to them because this was also yet another one of those things that I was like, this would be really important to know. And it was strange to me when I was looking into this. I'm like, that's weird. Like, and he works too. Like he's working all the time. He's probably working all hours of the day. Yeah. Because you're taking fares whenever they come in. You're working these odd jobs to make sure you're putting food on the table. Mm -hmm. And I mean, he was doing that when they were together. Yeah. So you have to assume that... He's still doing it when they're apart. So if Madeline had been home taking care of the house, taking care of the kids and stuff like that, mm-hmm. while he was out working, now he's doing double duty. He's still got to work, still got to take care of the kids and stuff like that. So it is strange to think that he would get full custody of the children unless there were reasons why the kids couldn't go with Madeline or maybe there was no like divorce or anything put through a court system or anything like that. Maybe they just split up and she was like, I'm out of here mm-hmm. and kind of left him with the kids. Yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, based on everything that I know and what I've read and interviews that the daughters have done, it seems like they had a good family life. So I don't know if it was just one of those things where it was easier because he had a job mm-hmm. and he could take care of them yeah. or, or he could provide for them at least. Yeah. So maybe she was like, you know what? You take full custody. I'm going to leave and find my own place. Maybe she was working on getting a job and then maybe they could reconvene at a later time. But since he was the one making the money, if that's the case, maybe she just said, you know what, you take full custody for now and we'll we'll reevaluate later. Okay. so the whole reason that I was going down that route Mm -hmm. is because if for some reason the kids were court ordered to stay with John Mm -hmm. and she wasn't happy about that. Mm hmm. Could there be some type of connection there where if John was out of the picture, Mm -hmm. she would again gain full custody of the children? Mm -hmm. So I totally see where you're going. Like I said last episode about 
You know, sometimes when you get off on a different way of thinking about the case, obviously I know the case you don't, I think you're off base. (laughs) So go ahead. If we're trying to find out or narrow down reasons why this had happened, something that stands out is that he had custody of the children. Mm -hmm. They separated. She ended up taking custody after he was murdered. Was there any connection there? It can very easily be ruled out as no, but you, you still have to ask the question. Absolutely. And I totally get where you're going with it. But now we're going to move into a very bizarre scenario that takes place sometime after John was killed. It could be nothing or it could potentially thicken the plot. So on February 21st, 1973, nearly three years after John had been murdered, his widowed wife, Madeline, headed out of the house after telling her children that she'd received a lead in her late husband's murder case and was going somewhere to follow up on it. When the kids asked her more probing questions like, where are you going and who gave you this lead, she didn't provide any answers. The following morning, when the kids woke up and noticed their mother wasn't home, they were instantly concerned about her. Then around 10 o'clock that morning, what's been described as a passing motorist found Madeline's crashed car off the side of the road. When authorities arrived on scene at around 10.15 a.m., they pronounced the 48-year-old widowed mother of five dead at the scene. The ME would go on to confirm her time of death as 2 o'clock that morning, so eight hours before she'd been found on the side of the road, and that her cause of death was from a, quote, crushed neck. Interesting. What time did she leave the house? That's not clear, but it seems like the night before. And how old was the oldest kid at this point? I'm not entirely sure of the kids' ages and exactly how they all went in order, but I do know that the twin girls were 16. Oh, okay, so they're close to adulthood so they're not like children you know fending for themselves while their mother goes out to try and follow this lead no so and i know this because the the girls were 13 when john was killed so obviously three years later they're Mm -hmm. older it seems like they had the kids relatively close in age so if i had to guess like over 10 yeah is there any more information regarding the crash yes i'm gonna get into that okay It's reported that she was involved in a one-car crash as she was driving east along Route 940 in Paradise Township, Pennsylvania. No county there, though. The scenario that authorities believed took place regarding the crash itself had been described in the Pocono record back in 1973. It stated, quote, Her car crossed the westbound lane, careened about seven to nine feet into the woods, and slammed into a 14-inch diameter tree shearing it off at the base. The car continued for several feet, pushing the tree trunk ahead of it, climbed over a felled tree, and came to a rest under a third, end quote. Well, I can understand how the cause of death was a crushed neck from a crash like that. Yeah, horrible crash. I'm wondering how they narrowed it down to a single car accident so easily. Mm, mm-hmm. I guess in, in the essence of describing it as such, mm-hmm. at the scene of the crash, there was only one vehicle. Correct. You can't necessarily say that another vehicle wasn't involved. Yeah, what if they cut her off? What if they, you know... Drove her off the road? Yeah, there are obviously other options there. But the thing that I think is really strange, and it stood out to me, I don't know if it would stand out to you, is that a passing motorist is who finds her car like this. It's said that she went into the woods like seven to nine feet, but then she pushed a few feet further, and then she's got these trees all on top of her car. Yet no one for eight hours, from 2 a.m. to 10 a.m., driving along that road, noticed anything. Is this just another New Bedford Highway? I got to pee in the woods and they found it? But why would they call him a passing motorist? I just feel like it's weird terminology. I don't think it's weird terminology. Somebody driving by the area saw this vehicle off into the woods. But why did nobody else see it? For eight hours. Maybe other people did see it and just didn't say anything, or it's not like this person could pull over to the side of the road and call on their cell phone. Yeah, okay. So this passing motorist had to see there was a problem there, Mm -hmm. go to some destination and make the phone call. Mm -hmm. Maybe because of the direction they were traveling and where the sun was in the sky at that point Mm. gave them a better view of the damage caused by... Madeline's vehicle going into the woods. Mm -hmm. I don't think that it's somebody that was involved. It's now going to place the call to police. Mm -hmm. I don't think anything like that, I think. 
maybe people didn't see it. Maybe people didn't care enough to make the phone call. Mm. This person saw enough of it and took the time Felt to go somewhere. Felt compelled to call. Okay. Yeah. All right. Now, with Madeline dying in this horrific crash just three years after her estranged husband was killed, this now left all five of the Leonard children without parents. I only saw it reported in one article, but based on that, it seems as though the children stayed with the mix, the owner of the taxi service John had worked for, as they didn't want the kids to be separated, which I thought was really sweet. And the next thing I'm going to mention, I also have only seen publicized in one article with the Pocono record, but John and Madeline's twins, Lori and Debbie, were interviewed for this publication. I wanted to bring it up as I think it could be important to the case, but based on how this article is written, it seems as though the daughters believe something more nefarious may have been at play when it came to their mother's untimely death. There's a particular passage in this article that stood out to me. It stated, quote, Police chief of Mount Pocono, Robert Hartman, came to our house. He was a friend of our dad's, and he told us he thought our mom was murdered as well, and he said the cases are linked, end quote. Which is why I was kind of thinking, how can authorities report that Madeline's accident was a single car accident mm -hmm. when you know, I, I'm sure the vehicle sustained heavy damage. So yeah. if somebody, you know, had bumped it from the rear or ran her off the road or whatever, it may be hard to, to mm -hmm. determine that. But when you said ran her off the road and I knew what was coming, I was like, mm -hmm. exactly. Right. And, and also the circumstances of it. She gets this phone call or gets this mm -hmm. information that there's a lead that she's following up on having to do with their father, her husband's death. Mm hmm. It's like, what are the odds that John was murdered? Mm -hmm. There's not a huge investigation going on, but I'm sure everybody that was affected by it wants to know what's going on. Yep. And then she randomly gets this information three years later, goes out to follow up a lead, and winds up dead too. It's most weird. people, Right. Most people would probably be like, they seem linked. It's too strange of a coincidence. Exactly. So, I mean, there is. There's a, there's a lot to unpack here. It's not like she got into a car accident on her way to work. Yes, she was going to follow up a lead on her husband's murder. Exactly. Did you say this interview where all this information was released came from 2021? Yes. But the twins are saying that this chief came and talked to them sometime after their mother's death. Yes. It's unclear exactly when, whether it was, you know, right after at some point later on. Yep. But yeah, they're saying that this particular guy said this to them. So in 2021, it's publicly announced or published. Mm-hmm that this chief came to the Leonard's children mm -hmm. and said, I think that your mother was murdered and is connected to your father's death. Yes. So I guess what I'm trying to get at is, why would he say that? Like, I get he was friends with the dad, but why would you say this to these kids to then make them think this horrible thing when they're already going through a horrible thing? I think it's hard to judge the situation without knowing more specifics. Exactly. And I think that's my biggest issue with this whole case and especially this piece of the case is there's just a lack of information. I get where you're coming from where why would he come and tell this to them? Mm -hmm. And my answer to that is without more specifics, mm -hmm. we can't really judge the situation because for all we know, one or multiple of the kids were looking into this yeah. and they went to the police station or whatever. And they were asking questions. Mm. The chief could have found out that they wanted to know more. And being a friend of John came to them and had this conversation with them. Yeah. We don't know the circumstances of why he went there. We don't know the circumstances or the time frame of when he went there. Mm -hmm. Were they 25 years old at the time that he talked to them? Yeah, that could change things you too. Know, it, it could be maybe he's retired at that time and mm -hmm. he's still thinking about it because this is a small community and shit like this doesn't happen very often. If he's the chief of a small town or a small police department, it's got to be baked into his memory and he's got to have connections to the kids. He probably feels bad for them. Mm -hmm. So maybe it was something that he wanted to get off of his chest too. So let's say what he said is the truth. Say that's what he believes and he thinks that there is absolutely a connection there and that's why he told the kids. So if she was definitely going to follow up on a lead, all of this just makes me think, was she actually on to something? And... Did someone maybe run her off the road to say, I need to get you off my trail because you're getting too close? Mm -hmm. So from there, I was like, all right, well, what more could go into this, right? So I tried to do a little bit of digging to see what else I could find. And 
The main question I had was regarding where the crash happened. So Paradise Township is only about a 10 minute drive from Cresco, which is where the family was living above Mix, assuming they still lived there at this time. But Route 940, at least in 2022, so it looks to be kind of on the edge of both Paradise Township, which is where her car crash happened, and Mount Pocono. So if she's driving east on Route 940, that would be leading her in the direction towards home, right? Mount Pocono is Cresco? No, Mount Pocono is basically the furthest in this, you know, little map of Mount Pocono, Paradise Township, and Cresco. I'm confused. If they okay. live in Cresco, she crashed in Paradise. Mm-hmm. Why do we even care about Mount Pocono right now? That's where Chief Hartman's from. Oh. So this is like where I'm getting with this is they must have believed that she was driving home. I believe that she was driving home. If it was two o'clock in the morning when she died, you would assume that whatever happened, she followed up on this lead. Maybe she talked to someone, whatever, and she was heading home because Mm -hmm. if she kept going east on Route 940, she would have wound up at home. But obviously she got in the crash in Paradise Township. But the town directly to the west, where she was either driving through or coming from, was Mount Pocono. So then Mount Pocono comes out in my mind because I'm like, okay, well, Chief Hartman was from Mount Pocono. That that was his town. And I'm like, it just all of it was, you know, kind of confusing me. I'm like, so where was she coming from? Was she coming from Mount Pocono? Is that why this chief is involved? This is confusing me. But then come to find out, Paradise Township doesn't have its own dedicated police department. So she dies in a town where, or she gets in this car crash in a town where there's no dedicated PD. Is that why Chief Hartman's involved? So you're wondering, like, because Paradise Township didn't have a police department, was this chief or some of his officers, were they filling in and essentially part of that crash investigation? Yeah. So is that why he talks to them? Because he's Mm -hmm. working on the case. Yeah. I didn't even think, like, what's his connection when you said that He was a chief of police and he was friends with John. I assumed that he was a chief of either where they lived or a place nearby. So, yeah, I would assume that he must have some type of information, whether it be through the grapevine or based on his investigation or the investigation from his department. So then that just makes me go back to, does he know something? And that's why he's saying something to the kids. He's just dropping a line to say, hey, Mm -hmm. you need to look into this type thing. I can't give you all the information. Mm -hmm. Maybe I don't have enough to go on or I'm limited in my ability to follow up on this. Yeah. But I'm going to tell you and kind of see where they go with it. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, I could see that. Yeah, so I just thought it was like all the connections are really interesting. Like, I know it's a little confusing to try and figure out the towns and what means what, but I think it's just hard, like, especially in these like smaller towns back in the 70s, back when you don't have a lot of information. Obviously, it's not publicized. So I think that just makes it a little more difficult. But there are all these little pieces that you can pull from it, like Mount Pocono, like where Chief Hartman was from, like the fact that he knew John and the direction she was driving, like all these little things. Does that mean that this wasn't just a crash? I mean, I think we're dancing around this, but I've already said, in my opinion, I don't think it is. I mean, even before you told us about the chief and mm-hmm. shit like that, I'm thinking, all right, how can they say it's a one-car crash? Like, what are the odds of this lady just driving off the road? Mm-hmm. It was 2 o'clock in the morning. Maybe she was tired. Maybe she fell asleep at the wheel, and mm-hmm. it was a single-car crash. But the fact that her husband was murdered, then she tells her kids that she's leaving to go investigate a lead that could reveal information about her husband's murder. Then she's coming back, presumably, from following up on that lead, and she ends up dead. I think it's probably connected, and I think it might be along the lines of like what you were saying. Mm -hmm. You know, she's on her way back. Maybe she went and talked to somebody. That somebody was like, oh, she's fucking on to me. Mm -hmm. Followed her, drove her off the road type thing. Yeah, definite possibility. And honestly, we've been sitting here talking about this for how long? And Mm -hmm. I think you could just go digging for days. More than anything, I think it's just hard to determine what at least I think happened based on the fact that there's not that much info out there. It was ruled an accident. Her death was not investigated in any way as a homicide. It seems like there wasn't much of an investigation going on into John's murder. And at the end of the day, as much as I would hope that it was just a tragic accident, it seems like something more nefarious may actually be at play. Yeah, it seems that way to me. And I'm wondering why nothing was really done with the murder investigation into John's death because he was clearly murdered. Yeah, How does you, that go nowhere? Yeah, and you see, like, there were, like, no articles. I, I always search newspapers.com. I want to see if there was anything that was published back 
when things first happened rather than update articles like the one I was just telling you from 2021. There's like nothing. With so little out there, I'm wondering how you even found this case. Like where was it reported on that it stood out enough to you to look into it? It was on Crime Watch Pennsylvania, and they have like this whole list of these are the cases that we need information on. And it stood out to me because there was a longer write-up. Usually on those sites, it's like a sentence. You have so-and-so was shot on so-and-so date. Reward is this much. Contact whoever. Mm -hmm. But on his, there was much more detail listed there. And I was like, hmm, this is intriguing. You know, let me look it up. And I found those couple articles like from the Pocono Record and the BRC TV 13. And I was like, okay, this is interesting. And some of them did like really good in-depth write-ups on the case. They interviewed the daughters and, you know, there was a lot of good dialogue there. But then as I tried to find older stuff, that's where I began to struggle. Like there just was not a lot reported back when it first happened, which is just so mind-boggling to me. So with the interview with the daughters Mm -hmm. from 2021 what was the general feeling you were left with after reading the article was it they were looking for answers or they were approached and asked about it no they're looking for answers and they've reached out so again here's this whole thing where you're in my brain exactly where we're about to move on to so just moving on in terms of where the investigation goes in the years that follow like I said it's just not clear but the twin girls have said in these interviews that they don't think there was an investigation done, whether it was lack of resources, not caring, whatever it was. The fact that it's been so many years without answers is frustrating to them. You could tell there was frustration there. And it was even reported that in 1999, Lori had written to both the Monroe County DA's office as well as the elected officials, presumably for the same county, to ensure that they provide the family with any information that they gathered and found to be of importance in terms of the investigation into her father's death. The Pocono Record stated that officials responded to her, and Lori was, quote, told that the family will be notified of any new developments in the case. Sixteen years later, the family still has heard nothing new, end quote. Well, I feel like a response like that is lip service. Agreed, yeah. It's like, oh yeah, we'll tell you about anything new. Nothing new might come of it, because it might not be their top priority with having such little information to go forward with because maybe there wasn't a well-crafted investigation put forward Mm -hmm. in the early days. But I would reach out and say, I don't want new developments. I want to know everything that's been done. Mm -hmm. I want to know where investigators went. I want to know how many people they talked to. You might be blacking out the names of the people they talked to, but I want to know the number of people they talked Mm -hmm. to. I want to know what was done and what can be told to me, and I'll do my own follow-ups on it. Because 16 years later, they've gotten no new info. Mm -hmm. Probably because if nothing was done back then, nothing was probably done for those 16 years either. Mm -hmm. Well, and it's been 52 years now. Right, since the very beginning, yeah. Yeah, so that's a long time. And you hear about these other cases, like last week's with Jane Pritchard, we talked about how they had interviewed over 300 people. Mm -hmm. Why didn't you interview every single person that went to Buck Hill Falls? Yeah, it's... uh, Or did you and you just didn't tell anyone? It's strange. I think that you might kind of be up the proverbial creek on (laughs) the investigation into Madeline's murder. Because if they deem that an accident and they did no follow-up on anything there, you're probably donezo with that. But they had to look more into John, so there should be stuff that was documented. They may be better off putting out some type of public plea... Anybody that knows anything, come to us off the record Mm -hmm. because you might get some people coming forward that maybe retired, maybe heard things through the different agencies, people talking and stuff, things that weren't done officially Mm -hmm. or information that wasn't documented officially Mm -hmm. that you'll get no other way. I mean, if this chief came forward and said something to them, people were talking, at least people in law enforcement were talking, and they probably thought something was up. Yeah. So if they could give him anything more to follow up with on that, who knows, you might not be able to prove anything, but if you can get in contact with people that may have had an air of suspicion around them, yeah, and you go and talk to them now, 52 years later, yep, maybe they're like, okay, I'll come clean or I'll give you information that I didn't want to give back then type thing. Yeah, and just to go back to your original question of how 
the interviews kind of ended off, I would say it's definitely frustration. I think they want answers Mm -hmm. and they're not getting them. Right. So moving on in 2000, something interesting regarding Buck Hill Falls, where John was killed, would take place. Before I get into that, though, I want to give you a little bit of background on Buck Hill Falls and its history. So this whole situation makes a little more sense. We talked a little bit about Buck Hill Falls before, but I'm going to give you the big old rundown now. So basically, like we talked about before, this case takes place in the Poconos. And this particular location where the inn was built was chosen specifically because it seemed as though it was frequented a lot by people in the early 1900s. It was owned and operated by Samuel Griscom, who came up with the idea for the inn, and Charles Jenkins, who funded the operation. The inn would go on to open its doors officially on Saturday, June 22, 1901. At the time the inn was built, it was just a 20-room hotel and lodge, which only took a whopping $20,000 in capital to open. On Sometimes Interesting's website, it stated, quote, The first iteration of the hotel was small, comprising just 20 rooms with no private baths, and took construction crews less than a year to finish, end quote. It's honestly wild how different things were back then. When I think of the Poconos and like the early 1900s and stuff like that, obviously it's kind of a mountainous region. I'm wondering if this was like a kind of a place where miners or something would frequent and stay. Oh, maybe. I think... Um, like the working man more so than a, a getaway type thing. Yeah, well, it seemed like there were a lot of, like, business people from, like, New York that would come over since it was so close by. Okay. So you had a lot of people like that coming. Like come in, stop there as they're on their way somewhere else type thing? Well, yeah, but people like to frequent it for vacation, too. I mean, obviously. <laughs> we tried to do that, but... <laughs> <laughs> not a good experience. Not a good experience. I just think... Thinking about it back in 1901, or how do they say it? I have no fucking idea what you're talking you about. You don't know what I'm talking about? 1901? Yeah, they, they say it in the Bob's Burgers episode. No, I have no idea. <laughs> but just thinking about like people back in like the early 1900s, you know, that region, it must have been beautiful. It must have been an enjoyable place to spend time. It's a pretty place, you know? Mm-hmm. So, anyway, as time went on and the inn became more popular, the owners realized they would need to expand. Over the years, Buck Hill Falls would grow into a 400-room, 300,000-square-foot, year-round resort facility. Honestly, if this place existed when we tried to take our trip to the Poconos, I probably would have booked it. (laughs) So it's not there anymore? No. Interesting. It had a huge golf course, an indoor pool, tennis courts, horseback riding, you name it, this place had it. However, by the time the 1960s rolled around the owners of the establishment began having some financial troubles. Then in 1970, the tragedy of John's murder took place on the property, and by the late 70s, early 80s, the place was practically in financial ruin. Buck Hill Falls Inn would go on to close its doors in 1990. Then, from 1990 to 2000, the place sat abandoned. As I'm sure most people know and have seen themselves before, rumor spreads like wildfire especially when you have a place like this in a small town. A huge establishment, shut down in the blink of an eye, left exactly as it once sat. And over time, these rumors began to spread about Buck Hill Falls Inn, most of which discussing the idea that the inn was haunted. As you (laughs) mentioned before. That's very interesting because from those pictures, like... You just post those up there and you say, oh, this is a haunted place. Mm -hmm. I would have no reason to deny that that place was probably haunted. Mm -hmm. So I've seen a lot of conjecture online regarding the haunting of Buck Hill Falls. But based on my research, I haven't been able to verify any of it. It seems as though people have discussed the fact that some murders had taken place on the property outside of John's, along with suicides as well. People have stated that room number 354 was the main room that would have been the most haunted, with numerous murders taking place in there specifically. But when you search any of the names that are listed on any of these sites, and you look into the history of Buck Hill Falls, all you really find is just more rumor and speculation. These names don't even show up in old newspaper articles. So essentially, it's become a story of its own. A few people put a a thing out there, and then it's just snowballed and evolved, and Mm -hmm. as more people tell it, it just keeps becoming bigger than itself. Exactly. There was probably one story back in the day that someone was like, oh my God, something happened in room 354. And then all of a sudden everyone goes crazy. And it's like, Mm -hmm. you know, you have one story here. It's like playing a game of telephone where it just changes periodically over time. Mm -hmm. But either way, John, tell me, 
Do you remember the MTV show Fear? I think so. All right. Is this where they took like a group of people and like put them in a haunted a place that was allegedly haunted and they had to like spend a certain amount of time there? Yes. So okay, I'm going yes, yes, to get I into that. Yep. Okay. So in 2001, this episode aired. Don't fret though. MTV did obtain permission to use the property for their show. And if you're unfamiliar with the premise of Fear, basically it was a TV show that gathered a group of young adults and brought them to a supposedly haunted location. There's no camera crew during the filming of the episode. Like, all the participants have to film with their own cameras, obviously provided by the show. But yeah, they're all filming. And this is, at least to me, presumably to make it more creepy, knowing that they have no help from a production crew and they're completely alone on said haunted property. And this was 2000, you said? Yeah, when it was filmed. So this was like right after Blair Witch Project type thing came out, too. Oh, so. okay. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. That, that makes sense. It's that handheld camera type. <laughs> yeah, you have like the thing you're seeing their face and it's all like shaking, whatever, <laughs> right. as they're walking through. Right. During the contestants' time at whatever property is chosen for that specific episode, they would have to perform dares during the night outside of their, quote, safe house. Basically having to do scary shit in a potentially haunted building to be able to win some cash, which, mind you, was only like 5000 bucks. You would have to pay me a lot more than that to participate in something like this. But the Buck Hill Falls episode is season one, episode six, which you can watch on YouTube. That's what you were watching the other day. Which I watched the other day. <laughs> yes. I don't like watching scary shit like this, even if it's totally fake. But I did it for the sake of research. Did they mention John's murder at all during it? No. Really? And it frustrated me. And I'm going to get into that in a minute. Okay. But outside of that, another big issue that I found with this is what I said before I even got into all that. Buck Hill Falls is not haunted. There's no way it's haunted. It it doesn't seem that way anyway. No. During the production of the episode, it seems as though there were some issues between the current owner and the production company because of the attempts to make a probably not haunted place seem haunted. Right. Right. So they were like almost defaming the property. They were uh, perpetuating these falsehoods or rumors about it being haunted and putting it on national TV. So now everybody that watched it was like, oh, shit, this place is haunted. Exactly. I don't like the dark. I don't like to go into the basement at night. Like that kind of stuff just creeps me out. You're going to hear weird noises. You're in the middle of the Poconos Mountains. It's. It's creepy, but. And your mind's going to play games on you. You're going to think you hear something when you really don't or. You know, you're you're already in a heightened state of anxiety because it's dark and they're telling of you it's haunted. Fear. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, but yeah, your, your mind is the one that plays the tricks on you. Exactly. Just watching it from the outside looking in, it's like, I'm sure there are other places that people have gone on this show that probably are either actually haunted mm-hmm. or more haunted. So it was just very interesting to me. So, I mean, I can understand why the owner would be pissed off because yes. now if he's trying to find a buyer... Mm-hmm. For it or trying to unload the property to but somebody. But he's in the episode. Still. So I don't know if it's I mean, like you could a... you could be in the episode and then once it goes to production and it gets released. Be you upset could have, with. Yeah, you could have a totally different idea of how, what it's going to be like. Yep. He was probably thinking or he could have been thinking it's going to disprove the idea that this place is haunted. Mm, I don't know. But I don't knows? know, just based I, on what he said. But either yeah. way, the owner at the time told the Pocono Record, quote, I think the MTV producers got a little frustrated when they were trying to tape a show called Fear and there wasn't any to be had, according to the psychics. That's why they may have gone to such great lengths to embellish, end quote. Yeah, and I'm sure whoever was the uh, site investigator or locator or whatever, whoever the, whoever the person was that was doing the research mm-hmm. to find these places to go try and film, yeah. they probably stumbled upon those stories that were yep. being told. and. Yep. They're like, oh, we can take those, tell these people this, put them in a dark place that's been abandoned for so many years mm-hmm. and, and work with that. Yeah, of course, they're trying to embellish. They're trying to get people to watch the show about haunted places. If they yeah. have these stories to work with, that's then what they're going to do. Just, exactly. But the owner obviously wasn't overly enthused about the episode when it aired. And it seems as though people who loved the inn and loved the place and all of that, they weren't really happy with its portrayal either. But regardless of all the speculation surrounding the inn and the notoriety it received because of MTV's fear, the place was beautiful. And no pun intended, it was hauntingly beautiful after it had been abandoned. 
I highly suggest taking a look at Sometimes Interesting's website as well as Only in Your State sites, which show a ton of pictures of the inn after it had been abandoned for years. I personally think the most eerie photo of them all is the one of the indoor pool. I'll have both sites linked in the show notes in case you guys want to check them out. Yeah, this is, um, I mean, you could imagine this being beautiful when it wasn't mm-hmm. abandoned. It's got like these big skylights, like the whole ceiling is glass. So you'd be able to see the night sky at mm-hmm. night, but you'd be able to get the sun rays during the day. Yeah, it's, But uh, isn't it crazy that a murder that we know is true happened on this property when in in all honesty, it seems like a really nice, wonderful place to spend time in. Well, murders can happen anywhere. Yeah, I know. It's just weird when it's like, you know, you hear about people who get killed in their home. People are targeting them, those kinds of things. It's like, why would you, if let's say what you were saying earlier about him potentially being lured there, why would you lure him there? Yeah, especially if it was like such a popular place and there's yeah. going to be a lot of people around. All the townies probably or all the people coming from out of town to spend time in the Poconos. I mean, you probably have like people there for a vacation. Yeah, it is odd. And it just sucks that not a lot of information's out there to have more specifics to try to come to a greater conclusion than what we have. Mm -hmm. Because there's not a lot really to go on. The thing that I just wonder, though, is like, why wouldn't you mention John's case in this episode or when talking about it? Probably specifically because it's the truth. Okay, yeah. It's an actual thing that happened. Yeah. And it's still an ongoing unsolved investigation. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you're taking all these stories that are total unproven Mm -hmm. tales, you can work with that. Yeah, that's true. You can craft whatever narrative around it you want. Whereas if you take John's story and you say, and this mysterious man came and shot him in the head four times, Mm -hmm. blah, 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 and put all all this information that's not true about something that really happened, then you're kind of... Yeah, and at the time, it was also more recent, too. Like, you have to think, like, a a lot of these other crimes that supposedly were committed there were way back in the day. You probably don't have any family members around anymore. You know, maybe they felt like they could craft a narrative around maybe someone that just unfortunately died in the hotel. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, you have the opportunity to craft that narrative around that rather than this coming out in 2000 with just 30 years prior, this man being killed. It's different than talking about someone who who died in 1902. Yeah, 100% with that. I think that without the ability to verify that all these narratives that they crafted around like mm-hmm. what these people had to do for their dares and the stories that they told that may or may not have actually happened, they can embellish like yeah. the owner said, said yeah. they probably did. Um, you don't want to embellish something that you know actually happened, that people were truly affected on it. Yeah. If you're going to talk about it, it's not because, you know, you're having a horror show where you're trying to get viewers. Yeah. The times when you would want to talk about something like that is when you're trying to bring more attention to it. You want to spread word about it and mm, see if you can yeah. you can help in a positive way. You don't want to use it for entertainment factor and say, oh, you need to go sit out in the, the main entrance way in a taxi that we put yeah, out there. Yeah, And you got to sit there in radio silence for an hour. Even like, just that's you saying just it right up. now just seems fucked up. Yeah, exactly, fucked up. yeah. So it's like talking about something that happened 75 years ago mm-hmm. is probably, you feel like, less of a scumbag. Or something that maybe didn't even really happen. Yeah, exactly. Or embellishing something that was much less than what they're making it out to be. Yeah. So... Buck Hill Falls Inn would actually end up getting demolished in 2017 after a long line of potential owners and investors had attempted to restore it. Unfortunately, they were all unsuccessful and down the property went. Well, you're saying a 300,000 square foot property. Yeah. It's been abandoned for decades. Where was it decades? Well, it was abandoned from 1990 to 2000 before Fear was filmed. And then nothing ever happened with it from 2000 to 2017. So you're looking at almost 30 years of it so, not being used. Right. So, yes, it was essentially abandoned for decades Yep. in the Poconos where you have all four seasons. Nobody's taking care of it. Mm-hmm. It would have been a better idea if you were like a developer or something, buy that property, demolish it, and just build something new on it because you but have all, all, like... old, all old technology in there, all mm-hmm. old walls. Everything's probably got asbestos in it and all this mold and everything yep. from the elements and, and shit. knob and tube. <laughs> no, knob, knob and tube. tube. <laughs> But anyway, now, after that brief history lesson, let's get back into John's story. In terms of any evidence that authorities may have that could be tested to hopefully one day hone in on a suspect, 
One of the officers that worked for the state police had told BRC TV 13 in 2021, quote, there's nothing new as far as evidence or new technology, because back then, 1970, DNA, you're 35 years before people are really thinking about it a lot, and there was nothing there at the scene. It was a pretty self-contained scene as far as being in the cab, and there was no real physical evidence recovered at the scene that could point us anywhere. A lot of cases today you see solved by genealogy and DNA, and we don't have anything in this case to work off, end quote. So I guess they're not only up Shit's Creek with Madeline's potential murder because they deemed it a crash or an accident, mm-hmm. but it seems like, I mean, you can guess at what it was, and if there was no physical evidence found at the scene, then there were probably no shell casings found at the scene, so whoever shot John four times picked up their shell casings before they left, leading me to believe that this was something that was planned. The reason why, we don't know. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't seem like anybody really knows unless there were interviews done where mm-hmm. they have leads to go on from there. Yeah. But it doesn't seem like, like you just said from that article, that there's any physical evidence to work. Yeah, and honestly, I think what he really means, if you get down to it, is that they're probably not going to solve John's case unless someone comes forward with information or confesses. Right. I think this is an unfortunate case where there was no physical evidence left at the scene. They don't have anything to work with now. And the only leads that they probably would have been able to gather, even at the time, would have been from statements. Yeah, rather than evidence. Right. It's only, oh, I saw this person. I saw this person. Whatever. Taking that description from what that part-time officer, the employee at Buck Hill Falls, gave police... And then going over to Globe Store with that and trying to follow up with that to see if you can find a lead there. Or then if you had any idea of who Madeline was actually going to meet up with mm-hmm. prior to her death. Well, it's reported that she never even told anyone. Didn't tell friends, didn't tell the kids, didn't How tell did police. How did she get the lead? You don't know because there's nothing on this case. Yeah. And that's what's frustrating. It's like if someone would go back and talk to the original officers or anyone that had been friends with Madeline, like I know it's a long time, like it definitely is, but if it just keeps sitting and no one's talking about it or talking to the people that knew this family, like did anybody talk to the mix? Like what did they all know? Mm -hmm. And it's like, there's just nobody talking about it. Yeah. And another frustrating thing is the fact that one of the twins had told BRC TV 13 Also in that 2021 article, quote, The stories have changed over the years. It depends who you talk to. There's a clue. There's DNA. There isn't. And it's like, stop giving us the runaround, end quote. Honestly, I think the best thing for authorities to do in a situation like this is to be honest. As much as it's going to suck in the moment to say, we have nothing to go on, I think the family would want and would expect honesty from authorities there's no DNA, if there's no clues, if the only thing that you can possibly use to solve this case is a confession, then just say it. Yeah, I think in a case like this where there very well might not be anything Mm -hmm. to go on, anybody that has the ability to look at a case file or something like that now, take a look at it, get in contact with the family. Yeah, You need to remove your ego from it and just say, hey, this is what we have. And unfortunately, I can't go back in time and change it, but this is what we have. And do with it what you will. Yep. And what I said before is the fact that both of these quotes were provided in the same article. So you're going to assume then that this previously employed either officer or detective with the state police was interviewed around the same time that one of the twins was. So why is it that a previous detective is saying there's no DNA, yet the family's feeling like they're being given the runaround here And sometimes people have told them that there is. Is there something that they found later on that now they're telling the family about? Or are they just getting their hopes up? Are they they not being honest? I think that whole situation is just weird that, like, it's in the same article and they're both kind of saying different things. Yeah, well, the the journalist who could have interviewed them, you know, maybe the journalist just went searching and ended up finding this trooper or officer or detective or whatever. And there's a good chance that the twins or the family never talked to this person in particular. Yeah, that's true. I just think, you know, maybe the twins had also reached out to the journalists themselves, too, and maybe they Mm. wanted the story published. And I mean, you don't know. I just think it's weird, though, that it's like you have all these different explanations of things. It's like if you don't have it, you don't have it. Yeah. And that's why I think that if you have a case that's, you know, 40 years old or 50 years old 
and there has been no forward progress in the investigation in the past decade or two, Mm -hmm. the family should be allowed to look at the case folder and do with it what they will. Because at that point, police really can't do that much more. Mm -hmm. If somebody has something to say and they want to say it to the police, they're going to go there and they're going to tell them, even if nobody's investigating the case anymore. Mm -hmm. So it's not like once police put out that information to the family or allow the family to see that and and they say we're not going to look into it any further we're going to give it to you you can do with it what you will yep it's not like somebody's not going to go to the police and say something now like the police are the ones you go to to give information exactly so just because they're not involved doesn't mean that they wouldn't receive a tip or something like that yeah no that makes sense i just think it does right by the family the person that was murdered Mm -hmm. and creates a better relationship between police and families affected by tragedies like this the families might not be happy with what was done all those years ago or what wasn't done mm-hmm. back in the day. But at least now there's a little humility in policing and they can say, it's not like, oh, I'm better than you. Oh, no, I'm a police officer. You can't yep. have this information. No, it's yep. like, I all get right. I get it. Go Here you go. Yep. This is kind of what you get. And it builds a better relationship to say, you can admit when you were wrong. You can admit when you fail. Yep. But I want you to know what was done or what happened. And that goes right back to just being honest. Mm -hmm. Like, it is what it is. Like, I understand in investigations that are a year, two years in, but when you're 52 years at this point... And nothing's been done for decades. You just gotta, like, put all your cards on the table Mm -hmm. and see what you can do together. Yeah. But authorities have stated that they're looking for witnesses to come forward to hopefully assist in closing the case. According to the Crime Watch website, it states, quote... Investigators are interested in hearing from any waiters or bartenders who were working at Buck Hill Falls Lodge during August or September of 1970, end quote. That's a tough ask. Yes, it absolutely is, but... Talking that that person probably had to be 16 years old at least. Mm-hmm. <laughs> probably older. Yeah. So you're talking these people are at least 65 years old plus now if they were employed back then. hmm It's possible. But the other thing is word of mouth and you have to assume that if something like this happens maybe a waiter or a bartender told a friend and that friend might still be around and they might say oh joe schmo worked at buck hill falls inn he was a bartender oh my god he told me this thing or maybe someone that worked at buck hill falls saw fear in 2000 mm-hmm, mm-hmm. They have a grandchild or a niece or nephew or someone that was younger that was watching it or whatever. And they were like, those stories that they're talking about, those aren't true. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you about something that I know happened. Yeah. And information that I know. Yeah. I could have told them something like that. So any publicity around something, even if it's not for the right reasons, Mm -hmm. is usually good because it spreads word of mouth. But anytime that you're dealing with something so sensitive as this, you want it to be in good faith. Yeah. Well, originally, and I'm glad you brought that up, too, because when I first started working on this case, I was like, do I want to put all this in here about fear and that whole situation? But it goes back to what you just said. Any publicity is helpful in one way or another because it can get people talking. So I'm like, what if I talk about Buck Hill Falls Inn and nobody remembers what it was just based on that name? But then they're like, oh, my God, I watched that fear episode. Because it was, it was so popular. That yeah, was show huge. was crazy popular. Probably millions of people who watched it. Mm-hmm. So if like the name doesn't click, but then you remember the show. Right. And then a conversation that you had around the show. Yeah. Brings mm-hmm. you back to what happened back when you were, you know, maybe they had a golf course. Maybe they were a caddy. You know what I mean? Yeah. You could probably do that when you were younger. Mm-hmm. So it probably brings you back to all of that and conversations you had and it jogs memories. So it's like as much as it did veer off the the main topic of our episode, I still think talking about fear and that whole situation was important to keep in here so that if someone's listening. Right. It brings in a whole different class of people that maybe didn't make the connection Mm -hmm. that John was murdered here. Yes. But then they saw that show and, you know, people of a much different age bracket. Exactly. Like me. Maybe their grandma told them. Right. I never heard of Buck Hill Falls. I never heard of the story before, but I've heard of fear and Mm -hmm. I probably watched that episode back then. Mm -hmm. It, It bridges the gap between different eras yeah and it just helps to connect it in one way or another right and even though that show may not have had it may not have done any justice to the investigation or brought anything to the investigation into john's murder yeah it brought light to the place Mm -hmm. connects people 
who have watched the show with other people that have maybe had some type of connection to that place and, like you said, gets people talking. So then that kind of leads me into theories and what you think might have happened here. I think there are pretty much two main options. It's that this person specifically called for this ride to lure John to Buck Hill Falls. Or, for all we know, it could have also been someone that he didn't know, some transient passing through, or a vacationer that was looking to potentially just commit a crime of opportunity. What do you think? I don't think it's a crime of opportunity. I think that what happened here was something that was planned. John was either lured there or something to that effect. And it was a targeted killing or execution. When you say a crime of opportunity, there has to be a a greater meaning behind the crime of opportunity, I think. Mm -hmm. There has to be some type of benefit to the person committing it. Okay. But then my other question is, if you're thinking this is a premeditated thing, why? We don't have enough info. Exactly. His family has said, though, he wasn't into any illegal activities. He didn't gamble. He didn't have any debts. He didn't have any enemies. But I mean, I guess that doesn't necessarily mean that someone wasn't out to get him. I don't know. I think this is something where you can speculate. You can try to come up with a reason. Yeah. But there's no information to lead you one way or the other, so it's almost useless. Yeah. Generally, when we speculate on things, it's because we have these facts, we have these circumstances, and we're kind of saying, okay, well, if this lined up with this, then that could have happened. In this instance, John had no enemies. From what we gather, there was no reason behind it. He didn't owe any debts to anybody. We have nothing to go on outside of my idea of maybe something going on between Madeline and him, but that's totally off the table now, essentially. I mean, Mm -hmm. it seems like for whatever reason they separated, and it was probably not amicable, but it wasn't like a a tense thing because she ends up coming back, taking care of the kids, and then she's trying to look into his murder down the road. Exactly. So there's not even a connection there. It's like... It's like every which way you look, there's no connection. Unless John had this secret from his family and there was something that was going on that nobody knew about. Mm -hmm. That's the only other way. But I can't say that this is a crime of opportunity because nothing was stolen. The car was there. Nothing was taken from the car. It's not a crime of opportunity to just kill someone. That's what they thought in Jane Pritchard's case. I don't think so. It's Could it be? Are some people just sick and they just want to hurt people? Yeah. Could somebody have, you know... And like, oh, I'm going to kill a taxi driver today. Yeah. And they just called and ordered a taxi and then they killed this guy? Mm-hmm. Sure, I guess. Um, but that's still planned. It's not a crime of opportunity. Like, they had this idea in their head. They called this guy. They got him to come here. Yeah. To Buck Hill Falls. hmm And then they killed him. I'm just very hard-pressed to say that anybody can just kill somebody as a crime of opportunity without some type of benefit mm-hmm. that they're reaping from the situation. No, it makes sense. So I think what we're getting down to here is we just don't know. It's clear we don't know. I mean, we don't know. It doesn't seem like investigators know. And sadly, the family doesn't know. The best thing that we can do is talk about it, Mm -hmm. get it out to people, get people talking, get people thinking back to fear and thinking back to anybody that may have worked in that area at the time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, hopefully through word of mouth and this story spreading, then it gets to we always say the right person and then somebody comes forward with information that can lead investigators some type of way. Yeah. Well, I think, and, you know, before we wrap up, this was something I wanted to touch on. It is the most frustrating thing to me about this case is that Buck Hill Falls has been talked about a ton. You hear about it online. You have all these websites that are talking about its potential haunting. You have fear. You have all this stuff. But the actual true information about a crime, a murder committed on this property is never talked about. Mm -hmm. I have not seen one YouTube channel, not one podcast, unless it's on like a Patreon or something and I can't get to it. But I haven't seen anybody cover this case or talk about this case. Sure, you can look at it in one respect of there's not a lot of information out there. How do you put out, you know, a good lengthy episode when there's not much to talk about? But I just think that's wrong. Like, I feel like we've had plenty to talk about here, and I think that talking about it, getting the case out there, getting it in front of people's eyes and ears to maybe recognize something is more important than just ignoring it. 
yeah, I think anytime something like this happens, there are people that are affected by it. And you got to think if you're in their shoes, you would want people talking about it. You would want Mm -hmm. some information about it. You would want people to be invested in the story. Maybe not to the same extent you are, but at least enough to seek answers and want to know more. And whereas I don't think there's a ton to go on from an investigative standpoint here because Mm -hmm. we, we don't know a lot. There are still a lot of circumstances that are worth talking about. You know, you have five children yep. that lost both parents in very strange circumstances. Mm-hmm. One murdered, one possibly murdered. Mm-hmm. And three of their children have passed away now. Mm-hmm. All three boys have died. So it's just the twins now that are trying to get answers. So they've lost five family members over all this time. And mm-hmm. they're the last remaining people in their family that have a connection to this. And they don't want to give up and I don't blame them. And they shouldn't. And I'm glad that you ended up finding this and we started talking about it because... I think that there is enough here to at least get people interested in it, wanting to know more. And maybe now on the internet, instead of talking about these fake ghost stories or whatever, Mm -hmm. these tall tales of things that may have never really happened there, now you can talk about the truth Mm -hmm. of the murder of John and the downward spiral of the entire family after that. Yeah. And maybe get some type of resolution for the remaining twins. Yeah, and I think more than anything... What really needs to happen is for somebody to come forward, whether it be even someone that Madeline talked to. If she was working leads from 1970 when he was killed to 1973, there were probably people that she talked to that might remember their conversation, that might have heard her say something that she dug up when she was searching for who could have killed him. And there are definitely different avenues to go down, regardless of the information that we have, just knowing that People most likely talked about this back then, and you may have heard something. It was probably the talk of the town back then because, like that interview that you were talking about, now people were locking their doors. Now people were worried. So this wasn't something that just happened and nobody cared about. Mm -hmm. This is something that shook the community that it occurred in and left a lasting impact Mm -hmm. on not only the family that was affected, but also everybody that lived around there because now they were scared of what could happen to them. Yeah. So then there are people who could have said something about it. Someone could have heard a friend that overheard a friend talking about maybe something they knew regarding the crime or someone they knew that could have committed the crime. Just rack your brains. Right. If you've heard anything over the years, just throw it at police because maybe they never heard about it before. Maybe they heard about it, didn't document it, and it's been lost over the years. Exactly. And I think just to go back to what authorities are looking for, if you worked there, If you frequented Buck Hill Falls, if you knew anybody that did, please come forward to authorities to tell them about anything you may have seen, may have heard. No piece of information is too small or insignificant. So with that, if you know anything at all about who killed John William Leonard Sr. at the Buck Hill Falls Inn in 1970, please contact the Pennsylvania State Police, Troop N, Swiftwater at 570-839-7701. Thank you all so much for tuning in every week. We're so happy to have you here. Make sure to leave us a five-star review before you go and follow us on our socials. You can follow us on Instagram at wicked.deeds.podcast and on Twitter at Wicked Deeds. Don't forget to visit our website, wickeddeedspodcast.com, to take a look at any photos from this episode and view our source material. But most importantly, tune in next week for an all-new episode.